Hello again, brethren. Welcome to another study on the close of probation. As you have previously seen, I did one video already explaining um, what is probation because it's very important that we understand uh, what probation actually is. So in this second video, we're going to examine, you know, how probation closes. Because so we're going to go for the scriptures to understand um, what it means when probation closes. And we want to see how exactly it closes, what causes uh, one's probation to close, basically. And um, we're going to start off in the scriptures, of course. We're going to start in um, Genesis chapter 1, as we see the account of creation is being given. And last of all, on the sixth day of creation, we see that um, a man was created, mankind came into existence. And um, especially as we see, Adam was first created and then Eve created afterwards, right? And we know that they were placed in the Garden of, of Eden, right? Um, let us get a quotation here from Patriarchs and Prophets pages 53 paragraph 1 and it tells us that like the angels the dwellers in Eden had been placed upon probation the happy estate could be retained only on condition of fidelity to the creator's law they could obey and live or disobey and perish you see that so we see not only man being on probation but angels were on probation also as intelligent beings right so we see both angelic beings and human beings were placed on probation and again as we continue in genesis chapter 2 from verses 15 it says that and the lord god took the man and put him into the garden of eden to dress it and to keep it and the lord god commanded the man saying of every tree of the garden thou mayest freely eat but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt not eat of it. For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. So we see the man being placed in the garden was given strict instruction. And we see that he was not created um, with the ability to only obey. But he had a choice whether to obey or to disobey. So we see the man has choice right a man has the ability to exercise choice of obedience or choice of, of of disobedience so let us continue um when we if we go to the book of uh, confrontation pages 12 paragraph 1 from uh, ellen white it tells us that uh, the lord placed man upon probation that he might form a character of steadfast integrity for his own happiness and for the glory of his creator you see that so man was placed upon probation to form character now whether the man would choose to continue to obey and form a righteous character he had that ability and whether he would disobey exercise his choice and fall under sin and um that also is his choice and we know eventually our first parents in the garden of eden uh, they sinned and um, now another element is come in disobedience so now we see the plan of salvation is to get man back to obedience to god and this is what was fulfilled in Jesus Christ. He came to show us the way how to be obedient to the law of God. And we know that man had the ability to either obey God or disobey God. So sin now coming into the picture, man now has the choice whether to continue in sin and to form a a unrighteous character or he could choose to obey God and continue to form a righteous character right and once that character is formed once that character is formed then then the probation will close as we continue 
So let's take a quotation here from Patriarchs and Prophets, pages 49, paragraph 4, and it tells us, God placed man under law as an indispensable condition of his very existence. He was subject to divine government, and there can be no government without law. God might have created man without the power to transgress his law. He might have withheld the hand of Adam from touching the forbidden fruit. But in that, in that case, man would have been not a free moral agent, but a mere automation. Without freedom of choice, his obedience would not have been voluntary, but forced. There could have been no development of character. See that? Such a course would have been contrary to God's plan in dealing with the inhabitants of the other worlds. It would have been unworthy of man as an intelligent being and would have sustained Satan charge of God's arbitrary rule. You see that? So to create man without the ability of without choice would make him a machine and God does not delight in machine. We were created to develop character. That's why we have the freedom of, of choice. So we're going to look at a prophecy here dealing uh, with probation to understand our choice in the matter. We see a prophecy given here in the book of Daniel chapter 8. And we're going to start from verses 13. It says that um, that is Daniel here uh, when the angel Gabriel, when he heard the angel Gabriel speaking, he says that, And then I heard one saint speaking, and another saint said unto that certain saint which spake, How long shall be the vision concerning the daily sacrifice and the transgression of desolation to give both the sanctuary and the host to be children underfoot? And he said unto me, Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. Right? So we see... Daniel is given a vision here, but he does not understand what this 2300 day prophecy is, right? So the angel Gabriel had to leave him for a season and then come back to him because um, he actually felt sick. So Gabriel was sent back to him to reveal the rest of the, 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 the vision to him. And the angel Gabriel returns in the book of Daniel chapter 9 to give him the rest of the prophecy. Um, from Daniel chapter 9 verse 24. And it says that 70 weeks are determined upon thy people and upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sin, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. So we see 70 weeks are given upon the Daniel and his people, meaning the Jewish people, right? And um, within that time period, uh, there were specific uh, fulfillments that they had to perform, right? Basically, probationary time given to them to make an end of sin, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Right? As we continue Daniel chapter 9 verse 25, it tells that, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three, three score and two weeks, the streets shall be built again and the wall even in troublous times. And after three score and two weeks shall Messiah be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince that shall come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary, and the end thereof shall be with a flood, and unto the end of the war desolations are determined. And he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week. And in the midst of the week, he shall cause the sacrifice and the oblation to cease. And for overspreading of abomination, he shall make it desolate, even until 
even until the consummation and that determined shall be poured upon the desolate. So this 70 week that was given to the Jews has to be understood, which is probationary time that was given to them to put an end of sin, to anoint the most holy, to anoint the Messiah. And as we continue in our studies, we'll take a quotation here from the book Desire of Ages, pages 233, paragraph 1. The burden of Christ's preaching was the time fulfilled, and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. Thus, the gospel message as given by the Savior himself was based on the prophecies. The time which he declared to be fulfilled was the period made known by the angel Gabriel to Daniel. Seventy weeks, said the angel, are determined upon thy people and uh, upon thy holy city to finish the transgression, to make an end of sins, and to make a reconciliation for iniquity, and to bring in everlasting righteousness, and to seal up the vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Daniel chapter 9, verses 24 to 27. A day in prophecy stands for a year, as we see in Numbers chapter 14 and verse 34, and also Ezekiel chapter 4, verses 6. The 70 weeks, or 490 days, represent 490 years, each day for a year. A going forth, a starting point for this period is given. So we need to understand when the 70 weeks actually begins, right? And a starting point for this period is given. Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the commandment to restore and to build Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two weeks, 79 weeks or 483 days, Daniel chapter 9 verse 25. The commandment to restore and to to build Jerusalem was completed by the decree of Artaxerxes in uh, the book of Ezra. Check Ezra, see Ezra chapter 6 verse 14 and Ezra chapter 7 verses 1 to 9. And this decree went into effect in the autumn of BC 457, the year, year 457 BC. From this time, the 483 years extended to the autumn of AD 27. According to the prophecy, this period was to reach to the Messiah, the Anointed One. In AD 27, Jesus at, at his baptism received the anointing of the Holy Spirit and soon afterward began his ministry. Then the message was proclaimed, the time is fulfilled. So, this 70 weeks included the anointing of the Messiah. And this 490 years, after 69 weeks extended to the year AD 27, when Jesus Christ was anointed, as the prophecy foretold. As you read it in Matthew chapter 3 and verse 16, it tells us, that and Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove, and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. So we see the prophecy reveals the anointing of the Messiah, which is Jesus Christ. Again, in the book of John chapter 1, and from verses 40 it tells us that and one of the two which heard Jesus speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon, Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother, Simon, and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted, the Christ. Right? We have found the Messiah, which is interpreted, the Christ. Right? And we know that when Jesus Christ came, he ordained twelve apostles and to, to, to go with him he had to teach them the gospel to, so that they themselves can carry on the work after he had ascended 
and um, but when he came, he said to them from in, in, Matthew, in the book of Matthew chapter ten, from verses five, it says that uh, these twelve Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, "Go not into the way of the Gentiles, and into any city of the Samaritans enter ye not, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel." So you see that this this time prophecy in the book of Daniel chapter eight fourteen and Daniel chapter nine from verses 24 shows that this time prophecy this 70 weeks prophecy was still in the effect and it was s it was specifically for the jewish nation so even though we see on different occasions that uh gentiles came to christ and throughout the whole scriptures we see gentiles receiving the gospel but um unless that specific time prophecy had not expired Jesus was to focus his, his abilities on preaching the gospel to the Jewish nation, right? But we know that they did not accept Jesus Christ as their Messiah. The majority did not, right? And the book of John chapter 1, from verses 10, it tells us, And he was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. And he came unto his own, and his own received him not this was already foretold in the book of isaiah uh chapter 53 you can read isaiah chapter 53 uh we just get a quick text here from uh, isaiah 53 verses 3 it tells that he is despised and rejected of men a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief and we hid as it will our faces from him and he was despised and we esteemed him not surely he had borne our griefs and carried our sorrows yet we did esteem him stricken smitten of God and afflicted but he was wounded for our transgressions and he was bruised for our iniquities the chastisement of our peace was upon him and with his stripes we are healed so we see again that the scripture already foretold that the Messiah would be rejected right and we know especially through the the leaders of the church at that time, especially the, the high priests, they were the, the leaders in the rejection of the Messiah. As you read here, because we know Jesus Christ went all about preaching the gospel in a lot of the cities around, you know, in that time. But the Jewish leaders, um, the high priests, they rejected him and they took counsel to kill him. And John chapter 11 verse 47, it tells us that Then gathered the chief priests and the Pharisees a counsel and said, What do we, for this man doeth many miracles? If we let him thus alone, all men will believe on him. And the Romans shall come and take away both our place and nation. And one of them named Caiaphas, being the high priest that same year, said unto them, He know nothing at all nor consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and that the whole nation perish not. And this he spake not of himself, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus should die for the nation. We see as the high priest, instead of um, accepting the Messiah, they prophesied of, of, of his death. They, they basically rejected him and plotted to to kill him right so we know the high priest they took counsel you know to put jesus to to death and uh, eventually we know they consulted with judas iscariot and um, he was paid 30 pieces of silver to identify you know jesus christ and so that he can be captured and we know um the night before the Passover in the Garden of Gethsemane, um, Judas brought the soldiers and um, they took Jesus, they captured him, and um, they brought him to the high priest. So we know that Jesus Christ stood before them and he was questioned and um, they, they brought false witnesses and all of that just to get him convicted. And in the book of Matthew chapter 26, uh, verses 63, it tells us that uh, but Jesus held his peace and when the high priest answered and said unto him, 
I adjure thee by the living God that thou tell us whether thou be the Christ, the Son of God. Jesus saith unto him, Thou hast said, Nevertheless, I say unto you, Hereafter shall ye see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds of heaven. See that? Then the high priest rent his clothes, saying, He hath spoken blasphemy. What further need have we of witnesses? Behold, now ye have heard his blasphemy. So we see the high priest, they were persistent in their rejection of Christ. And Matthew chapter 26 shows us that Christ has said, like, look, hereafter you shall see the Son of Man sitting on the right hand of power and coming in the clouds. Then the high priest rent his clothes, saying he has spoken blasphemy. Right? So the high priest rent his garment. Right? And that is very significant. We need to understand the significance of the renting of the garment. These are pages, pages 708, paragraph 3, tells us that Conviction mingled with passion led Caiaphas to do as he did. He was furious with himself for believing Christ's words. And instead of rending his heart under the deep sense of truth, and confessing that Jesus was the Messiah, he rent his priestly robes in determined resistance. This act was deeply significant. You see that? He was furious with himself for believing Christ's words. And instead of rending his heart on the deep sense of truth and confessing that Jesus was the Messiah, he rent his priestly robes in determined resistance, hmm. open rejection of the Messiah. That is very significant what he did. This act was deeply significant. Little did Caiaphas realize its meaning. In this act done to influence the judges and secure Christ's condemnation, the high priest had condemned himself. By the law of God, he was disqualified for the priesthood. He had pronounced upon himself the death sentence. So you see that? By rejecting the Messiah, he closed his probation. You see that? And this is what Caiaphas, the high priest, was trying to bring across, that Christ was a blasphemer, rending his garments to show that Christ was a blasphemer. But little did he know that he, in passing condemnation on Christ, he was condemning himself by renting that garment. Right? As we continue, Isaiah Ages, pages 708, paragraph 4, he tells us that a high priest was not to rent his garments. By the Levitical law, this was prohibited under sentence of death. Under no circumstances, on no occasion, was the priest to rent his robe. It was the custom among the Jews for the garments to be rent at the death of friends. But this custom the priests were not to observe. Express command had been given by Christ to Moses concerning this. And this is exactly what Aaron avoided when in, in the book of Leviticus chapter 10, when we see Aaron's two sons while performing the service of the priest, they had done the service wrong, basically, because they were intoxicated, right? And they used common fire in the place of the fire that was ordained of God. And they died instantly. And what Aaron the father attempted to do, he attempted to rent his garment, right? But he was given counsel, look, you should not rent your garment because you are the anointed priest. And if Aaron had rent his garment at that time, he himself would have died. So you see that? That was strictly forbidden. The priest had not to practice these things. And this is exactly what Caiaphas did. He rent the garment and condemned himself. He closed his probation by openly rejecting Christ.
because we know that the, the garment of the priesthood, that white linen, represents the righteousness of Christ. Let us go to Revelation chapter 19 and verse 7. It tells us, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife have made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. You see that? So this white linen that the, the high priests are covered with to do the service, this is a symbol of the righteousness of Christ. And by renting that garment, renting that righteousness, Caiaphas, trying to condemn Christ, he condemned himself, and it showed that he rejected, he rejected Christ, and he closed his probation. He closed his probation. As we continue here, these are pages, pages 709, paragraph 1, it tells us, Everything worn by the priest was to be whole and without blemish. By those beautiful official garments was represented the character of great antitype, Jesus Christ. Nothing but perfection in dress and attitude, in word and spirit, could be acceptable to God. He is holy, and his glory and perfection must be represented by the earthly service. Nothing but perfection could properly represent the sacredness of the heavenly service. Finite man might rend his own heart by showing a contrite and humble spirit. This God would discern, but no rent must be made in the priestly robes, for this would mar the representation of heavenly things. The high priest would dare to appear in holy office and engage in the service of the sanctuary with a rent robe was looked upon as having severed himself from God. By rending his garment, he cut himself off from being a representative character. He was no longer accepted by God as an officiating priest. This course of action, as exhibited by Caiaphas, showed human passion and human imperfection. You see that? So Caiaphas closed his probation by rejecting Christ, by rejecting the truth. You see? And not only that, what he did was, and after they did that, they brought him and they took him to Pilate. We know that uh, as we follow this story here in Matthew chapter 27 from verse 1, it says that when the morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And when they had bound him, they led him away and delivered him to Pontius Pilate, the governor. You see that? And they, they had a very good reason for bringing him to, you know, Pilate, as we see a unity of church and state to bring persecution, right? Another quotation here from the Zav Ages, pages 724, paragraph 5, it tells us that the priests thought that with the weak and vacillating Pilate, they could carry through their plans without trouble. Before this, he had signed the death warrant hastily, condemning to death men they knew were not worthy of death. So one of the reasons they brought Christ to Pilate because he was very hasty in you know in in passing condemnation or so, and um, it was a, a, a an unhealthy practice on the part of Pilate. Is something he practiced continually. So this is one of the reasons why the Jewish people brought Christ to Pilate so that they can speedily get rid of him, right? It says that uh, in, in his estimation, the life of a prisoner was of little account. Whether he were innocent or guilty was of no special consequence. The priest hoped that Pilate would now inflict the death penalty on Jesus without giving him a hearing. This they besought as a favor on the occasion of the great national festival. You see that because we know the the feast of the Passover was uh, just hours away, and they wanted to get rid of Jesus Christ speedily so that they can continue or they can go into their festivities. And they know Pilate was swift in bringing you know death. To prison the prisoners that they had brought before him but um, the scripture tells that Pilate you know he honestly did not want 
to to kill to 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 kill Christ because he saw that innocence in Christ, but um, his actions, you know, will tell what basically happened to him also. Um, Matthew chapter 27 verse 11 tells us and Jesus stood before the governor and the governor asked him saying art thou the king of the Jews and Jesus said unto him thou sayest and when he was accused of the chief priests and elders he answered nothing then said Pilate unto him hearest thou not how many things thou witness against thee and he answered him to never a word in so much that the governor marveled greatly right governor marveled now, Pilate had previously practiced all those evils, and we see that his probation was not yet closed. And this basically was his last opportunity to accept, accept the gospel and repent and be converted. Desire Ages, pages 726, paragraph 5, tells us that Jesus did not directly answer this question. He knew that the Holy Spirit was striving with Pilate. And he gave him opportunity, opportunity to acknowledge his con conviction. The Holy Spirit was striving with Pilate and he gave him opportunity to acknowledge his conviction. So we see while Christ stood before the governor Pilate, the Holy Spirit was convicting Pilate. Look, this is wrong. You need to release him. But Pilate was very stubborn. Right? His probation had not closed. His probation had not closed, right? As we continue, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, he asked, or did others tell it thee of me? That is, was it the accusations of the priests or a desire to receive light from Christ that prompted Pilate's question? Pilate understood Christ's meaning, but pride arose in his heart. See that? He would not acknowledge the conviction that pressed upon him. Am I a Jew? He said, Thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee unto me. What hast thou done? You see that? So during all of this, the, we see that the, the, the probation for the high priest had already closed. He fully rejected Christ. He closed his own probation. And we see now, Christ now being brought to Pilate. The Pilate, for all his pride now, is resisting the conviction of the Holy Spirit to the right. And he's only being... Uh, he's only allowing himself to do wrong and not, you know, doing what is right. And um, Matthew chapter 27 from verses 19 tells us that. And when he sat down on the judgment seat, that is Pilate, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with that just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and the elders persuaded a multitude and that they should ask Barabbas and destroy Jesus. So we see the last attempt on God to save Pilate because he was so stubborn with pride. He was resisting the Holy Spirit. So the Holy Spirit now had to work through his wife to try to bring that message to him so that he can release Christ. But even that warning he rejected and he did not release christ right he eventually released the yet well the, the jewish people we know they asked for barabbas in the place of christ and um pilate attempted to wash his hands and and say look he has nothing to do with this but um we know that he rejected even the last warning that was given through his wife uh, Desire Ages, pages 732, paragraph 1, tells us that uh, even now Pilate was not left to act blindly. A message from God warned him from the deed he was about to commit. In answer to Christ's prayer, the wife of Pilate had been visited by an angel from heaven. And in a dream, she had beheld the Savior and conversed with him. Pilate's wife was not a Jew. But she looked upon Jesus in her dream. She had no doubt of his character or mission. She knew him to be the Prince of God. She saw him on trial in the judgment hall. She saw the hands tightly bound as the hands of a criminal. 
she saw Herod and his soldiers doing their dreadful work. She heard the priests and the rulers filled with envy and malice, madly accusing. She heard the words, We have a law, and by our law we ought to die. She saw Pilate give Jesus to the scourging after he had declared, I find no fault in him. She heard the condemnation pronounced by Pilate and saw him give Christ up to his murderers. She saw the cross uplifted on Calvary. She saw the roof wrapped in darkness and heard the mysterious cry, It is finished. Still another scene met her gaze. She saw Christ seated upon the great white cloud while the earth reeled in space and his murderers fled from the presence of his glory with a cry of horror, she awoke and at once wrote to Pilate words of warning. You see that? So she saw a vision of the second coming of Christ as revealed in Revelation chapter 1 from verses uh, 7. You saw um, Christ coming in the clouds and we know that these men would be resurrected to see Christ coming in the clouds. All that was revealed to his wife and given to her so that she could warn him to turn away from doing his evil but he rejected that last offer of mercy and he gave Christ into the hands of the Jews. And we know when he did that, he closed his probation. The Zavages, pages 733, paragraph 1, tells us, Pilate's face grew pale. He was confused by his own conflicting emotions, but while he had been delayed to act, the priests and the rulers were still further inflaming the minds of the people. Pilate was forced to action. He now bethought himself a custom which might serve to secure Christ's release. It was customary at this feast to release someone prisoner whom the people might choose. This custom was of a pagan invention. There was not a shadow of justice in it, but it was greatly prized by the Jews. The Roman authorities at this time held a prisoner named Barabbas, who was under sentence of death. This man had claimed to be the Messiah. He claimed the authority to establish a different order of things, to set the world right. Under satanic delusion, he claimed that whatsoever he could obtain by theft and robbery was his own. He had done wonderful things through satanic agencies, and he had gained a following among the people and had exercised sedation against the Roman government. Under cover of religious enthusiasm, he was a hardened and desperate villain, bent on rebellion and cruelty. By giving the people a choice between this man and the innocent savior, Pilate thought to arouse them to a sense of justice. He hoped to gain their sympathy for Jesus in opposition to the priests and rulers. So turning to the crowd, he said with great earnestness, Whom will ye that I release unto you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ? You see that? You see that? So Matthew chapter 27, verses 17 tells us that, Therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate, Therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, whom will ye that I release unto you? Barabbas or Jesus, which is called Christ. For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. And he knew Jesus was innocent because he had pronounced at least three times that he find no fault in him. So he was willfully doing something that was wrong. And the book of James chapter 4 verse 17 tells us, To he that knoweth to the right and doeth wrong to him that is sin and by doing that Pilate grieved the Holy Spirit he closed his probation the savage is 738 paragraph 2 tells us Pilate longed to deliver Jesus but he saw that he could not do this and yet retain his own position and honor rather than lose his worldly power he chose to sacrifice an innocent life how many to escape loss of suffering in a like manner sacrifice principle? Conscience and duty point one way and self-interest points another. 
the current sets strongly in the wrong direction and he who compromises with evil is swept away into the thick darkness of guilt. Bizarre Ages, pages 738, paragraph 3 tells us, Pilate yielded to the demands of the mob. Rather than risk losing his position, he delivered Jesus up to be crucified. But in spite of his precautions, the very thing he derided after came upon him. His honors were stripped from him. He was cast down from his high office and, stung by remorse and wounded pride, not long after the crucifixion, he ended his own life. So all who compromise with sin will gain only sorrow and ruin. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. That's Proverbs chapter 14 and verses 12. You see that? So he was trying to save his seat and his, and his integrity and in delivering Christ to the Jews to be murdered, and he knew it was wrong, he closed his probation. And not long after, he lost his seat and eventually took his own life. So you see, he, again, he rejected Christ, he closed his probation. Right? These are pages, pages 233, paragraph 2, tells us that. Uh, then said the angel, he shall confirm the covenant with many for one week, which is seven years. For seven years, after the Savior entered on his ministry, the gospel was to be preached especially to the Jews for three and a half years by Christ himself, right? Because we know after the end of three and a half years, Christ was crucified. And afterward, the apostles, in the midst of the week, he shall cause sacrifice and oblation to cease. Daniel chapter 9, verse 27. In the spring of AD 31, Christ was the true sacrifice offered on Calvary. Then the veil of the temple was rent in twain, showing that the sacredness and significance of the sacrifice or service had departed. The time had come for the earthly sacrifice and oblation to cease. And that is in accordance with Matthew chapter 27 from verses 50 and 51. It tells us that when Christ was crucified, the veil of the temple was rent. So no more earthly sacrifice, right? And that was in the year AD 31, three and a half years after Christ was anointed. So we see during that time of probation for the Jewish people to anoint the most holy that um, in AD 31, Christ was cru crucified three and a half years into his ministry. So there still remained three and a half years for the apostles now to go forward and preach the gospel, seeing that the high priests, they had um, rejected Christ. So we see that even before probation had generally ended, the high priest, his probation was closed already. The same year that he killed, they killed Christ, his probation was closed in 8031 also, the same year they killed Christ. And, right? and we see that Christ, you know, three days after he was resurrected, and um, he was seen of the apostles and, you know, different people uh, 40 days after. And when it was time, when the time was come for him to ascend now into heaven, we read the book of uh, Acts chapter 1 from verse 7. And it says that, uh, and he said unto them, he is not for you to know the time or seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power. After that, the Holy Ghost is come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Right? And when he had spoken these things, while they beheld, he was taken up, and a cloud received him out of sight. So, we see that after his resurrection, before he ascended, he promised the Holy Ghost to the apostles so that they can continue to preach in Jerusalem, in Judea, in Samaria, and onto the uttermost parts of the world. So we see probationary time had not generally closed for the Jewish people as yet. And, uh, but probation had already closed for the high priest and for Pilate and all these men associated with his death. Their probation had already closed. Great Controversy, pages 27, paragraph 3, tells us, 
For nearly 40 years after the doom of Jerusalem had been pronounced by Christ himself, the Lord delayed his judgment upon the city and the nation. Wonderful was the long suffering of God with the rejection of his gospel and the murderers of his son. The parable of the unfruitful tree represents God's dealings with the Jewish nation. The command had gone forth, cut it down, why cumber it the ground? Luke chapter 13 and verse 7. But divine mercy had spared it yet a little longer. There were still many among the Jews who were ignorant of the character and of the work of Christ. And the children had not enjoyed the opportunities or received the light which their parents had spurned. Through the preaching of the apostles and their associates, God would cause light to shine upon them. They would be permitted to see how prophecy had been fulfilled, not only in the birth and the life of Christ, but in his death and resurrection. The children were not condemned for the sins of the parents. But when, with the knowledge of all the light given to their parents, the children rejected the additional light granted to themselves, they became partakers of their parents' sins and filled up the measure of their iniquity. See that? They filled up the measure of their iniquity. So we see AD 31, Christ is rejected by the leaders of the church. Their probation is closed. But generally, probation has not closed for the Jewish nation. Why? Because the children now has to be given an opportunity. They have to be, that light has to be brought to them. And if they reject that light that is brought to them, then their probation will close. And we know that the apostles preach the gospel in Acts, the book of Acts, and we know that the apostles were rejected by the children themselves. And we know when probation closed, as we read here in Acts chapter 7, from verses 54, the stoning of Stephen. We see that, and when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and gnashed upon him with their teeth. But he, being full of the Holy Ghost, looked up steadfastly into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing on the right hand of God. Right? So he see Christ standing, meaning no more intercession. Right? No more intercession. And said, Behold, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Then they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and ran upon him with one accord and cast him out of the city and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at the young man's feet whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. So we see the stoning of Stephen in AD 34, marks the end of probation for the Jewish people, marks the end of the 490 years allotted specifically to the Jews. That time was given to them to put away sin, but they did not put away sin. Right? They continued in sin and rejected the Messiah and rejected the gospel, and for that their probation closed. But then again, we see that probation having closed for the Jewish nation, we see after that Paul being converted, the apostle Paul being converted, and we know the apostles Peter, James, and the apostles that brought the gospel throughout the world, their probation had not closed because they accepted the truth. So again, we see you close your own probation when you reject the truth. And we know after the Jewish probation had closed in AD 34, we see then the gospel being taken now to the Gentiles as we read in Acts chapter 13 from verses 45. It tells us that um, after Paul was converted, he went about preaching the gospel and this is what Paul is saying to them. Acts chapter 13, verse 45, it says that, But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and speak against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. 
Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold and said, It was necessary that the word of God should first have been spoken to you, but seeing you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy of everlasting life, lo, we turn to the Gentiles. You see that? So that word had to be first spoken to them, but they seeing that you put it from you and judge yourselves unworthy. So you see who rejected the gospel? Who closed the probation? They closed their probation in unrighteousness. So does that mean every Jew walking around today that his probation is closed? No. It only means that the responsibility given to them to preach the gospel of Christ to the world has come to an end because they have fully rejected Christ. But every individual Jew which accepts Christ will be saved will be saved. So we see now this prophecy of Daniel chapter 9 come to an end. The 70 weeks come to an end. As we read in Great Controversy, pages 328, paragraph 1, it tells us, The 70 weeks, or the 490 years, especially allotted to the Jews, ended, as we have seen in the year AD 34. And we know that, according to the scriptures, the high priest probation closed before AD 34. At that time, through the action of the Jewish Sanhedrin, the nation sealed its rejection of the gospel by the martyrdom of Stephen and the persecution of the followers of Christ. You see that? Then the message of salvation, no longer restricted to the chosen people, was given to the world. The disciples, forced by persecution to flee from Jerusalem, went everywhere preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. Peter, divinely guided, opened the gospel to the centurion of Caesarea. The god friend Cornelius and the ardent Paul, one to the faith of Christ, was commissioned to carry the glad tidings far hence unto the Gentiles. That's Acts chapter 8 and verses 4, uh, Acts chapter 5, verses 22-21. We see that. So they, the Jews basically sealed the rejection of the gospel by the stoning of Stephen. So they closed their probation. Closed. And they, they basically grieved the Holy Spirit. They closed their probation in unrighteousness. Ephesians chapter 4 verses 30 tells us that and grieve not the Holy Spirit of God whereby you are sealed unto the day of return, the day of redemption. And all these men who had had taken in the death of Christ, in the murder of Christ, according to Revelation chapter 1, verses 7, they will rise up in the resurrection to see the second coming of Christ. Again, a quotation here from Desire Ages, pages 322, paragraph 2, it tells us, It is not God that blinds the eyes of men or hardens their hearts, he sends them light to correct the errors and to lead them into safe paths. It is by the rejection of this light that the eyes are blinded and the heart hardened. You see that? It is not God that blinds the eyes of men. He sends them light to correct the errors. That is the purpose of the gospel. Right? And to lead them onto safe paths. It is by the rejection of this light that eyes are blinded and the heart hardened. Often the process is gradual and almost imperceptible. See that? Light comes to the soul through God's word, through his servants, or by direct agency of the Spirit. But when one ray of light is disregarded, there is a partial benumbing of the spiritual perceptions, and the second revealing of light is less clearly discerned. You see that? So when we willfully practice in things that are wrong, we know that are wrong, we only making it harder on ourselves to be saved. The more you reject, the more your heart gets hard. The more you reject, the more you harden your heart until what? You fully harden yourself in disobedience and close your probation. It says that, so the darkness increases. The darkness, so we see the more light you reject, you are equally filled up with darkness. The darkness increases until it is night in the soul. Thus it had been with these Jewish leaders. They were, convinced, they were convinced that the divine power attended Christ, but in order to resist the truth, 
they attributed the work of the Holy Spirit to Satan. In doing this, they deliberately chose deception. They yielded themselves to Satan, and henceforth they were controlled by his power. See that? So the gospel was to them so that they can repent and put away sin as we see. But they continually rejected, gradually rejected, and in essence, closed their probation in unrighteousness by resisting the truth. Right? And every time we reject the truth, we reject, we see that darkness increase until it is night in the soul. And this is exactly what happened to, to Judas Iscariot. This is exactly what happened to Judas also. When after the, the ceremony in the upper room with Christ, the Last Supper, he rejected the last offer of mercy and he left the upper room. And the scripture says that it was night. It was not only physical night, but it was night in him. So he had fully rejected, fully rejected the Holy Spirit. And his probation closed also. So this is what we see, this is how we, we know, you know, we understand. By rejecting this life, probation closes on an individual first before those who accept it. Another piece of evidence to support this study, we know that the Apostle Paul, he went everywhere preaching the gospel, and we know he eventually had to go to testify in Rome, as we read in Acts chapter 23 and verse 11. It tells us that, and... and and the night following, the Lord stood by him, that is Paul, and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so thou must bear witness also at Rome. So Paul had to go to Rome to testify of the Lord, to bring his message there. And Paul eventually stood, you know, he was brought before the emperor of Rome, which was the emperor Nero. I mean, Nero was a very wicked emperor. He killed a lot of Christians, but his probation had not closed because Paul was specifically sent there and eventually met him to actually bring the offer of salvation to him regardless of what he had done. Acts of the Apostles, pages 496, paragraph 1, it tells us that never before had Nero heard the truth as he had heard it on this occasion. Never before had the enormous guilt of his own life been so revealed to him. The light of heaven pierced the sin-polluted chambers of his soul, and he trembled with terror at the thought of a tribunal before which he, the ruler of the world, would finally be arraigned, and his deeds received their just award. He feared the apostles of God, and he dared not pass sentence upon Paul, against whom no accusation had been sustained. A sense of a restrained for a time his blood thirsty spirit. You see that? So Paul testifying before him is now giving him an opportunity to repent. The light of the knowledge of truth pierced his darkened heart. Right? And for a moment he considered, for a moment, for a moment he would have repented. But look at what the next uh Text tells us, uh, Acts of the Apostles, pages 496, paragraph 2, it tells us, For a moment, heaven was open to the guilty and had a Nero, and its peace and purity seemed desirable. That moment, the invitation of mercy was extended even to him. But only for a moment was the thought of pardon welcome. You see that? Then the command was issued that Paul be taken back to his dungeon. And as the door closed upon the messenger of God, the door of repentance closed forever against the emperor of Rome. You see, who closed, who closed emperor's Nero probation? Let me read that again. For a moment, heaven was open to the guilty and had a Nero, and its peace and purity seemed desirable. That moment, the invitation of mercy was extended even to him. But only for a moment was the thought of pardon welcomed. Then the command was issued that Paul be taken back to his dungeon. And as the door closed upon the messenger of God, the door of repentance closed forever against the emperor of Rome. No ray of light from heaven was ever again to penetrate the darkness that enveloped him. Soon he was to suffer the retributive judgment of God. 
See that? So we see the light for correction, the light of the gospel being brought to Nero, and he willfully rejects it, closing his probation. As soon as he gave the command to close the door, close the dungeon door on, on the apostle Paul, put him back in the prison, the door of his probation closed. So you see who closed? He closed his probation. Right? He closed his. And this is everyone, everyone has that choice. Whether they will accept the gospel or they will reject the gospel of salvation. Again, the Zavages, page 489, paragraph 5, tells us that the true witness says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Every warning, reproof, and entreaty in the word of God or through his messengers is a knock at the door of the heart. It is the voice of Jesus asking for entrance. You see that? With every knock unheeded, the disposition to open becomes weaker. Hmm. The impressions of the Holy Spirit is disregarded today. Will not be as strong tomorrow. The heart becomes less impressible and lapses into a perilous unconsciousness of the shortness of life and of the great eternity beyond. Our condemnation in the judgment will not result from the fact that we have been in error, but from the fact that we have neglected heaven sent opportunities for learning what truth is. So we see that Christ is constantly knocking at the door, um, giving us, you know, convicting us through the Holy Spirit. And every time we neglect to accept our wrong and repent and make it right, we're making it harder day by day, day by day. And it will finally come to that time when we are so hardened in our heart that no more light will come to us on the issue. And we close our probation. Right? And I read that again. These are ages, pages 489, paragraph 5. The true witness says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. Revelation chapter 3, verses 20. Every warning, reproof, and entreaty in the word of God or through his messenger is a knock at the door of the heart. It is the voice of Jesus asking for entrance. With every knock unheeded, the disposition to open becomes weaker. The impressions of the Holy Spirit, if disregarded today, will not be as strong tomorrow. The heart becomes less impressible and lapses into a perilous unconsciousness of the shortness of life and of the great eternity beyond. Our condemnation in the judgment will not result from the fact that we have been in error, but the fact that that we have neglected heaven sent opportunities for learning what the truth is. See that? So you see what will condemn us? Light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light. John chapter 3 and verses 17. And that is the condemnation. We are not condemned because we are sinners. We condemn ourselves when we reject the solution to our sin problem. And that is how the probation closes for the unrighteous. That is how probation closes for the unrighteous. So this probation every time is given for us to form character. Whether you are forming a righteous character or you are forming unrighteous character, you would close your probation. And when the last individual and when the Sunday law Christ is coming to full effect and the last individual has made his decision either for Christ or against Christ, then Christ will stand up. So thank you and have a blessed day and goodbye.